we would like to start with saying congratulations to the Nobel Prize, Professor Henderson. Thank you very much. I would really like to know why you started with electron microscopy. Uh, I think it's never so easy to explain why, because in science you have to follow uh, the line of least resistance. So I came um, as an undergraduate from physics and investigated all the possible types of physics that might be interesting and exciting to go into as a graduate student. So, you know, at your stage and sort of distilled plasma physics, astrophysics, single particle physics, solid state physics, decided on biophysics. And then my plan was as a postdoctoral scientist and then as a, as a young independent scientist, simply to use the established structural methods, that's X-ray crystallography, to work on membrane protein structure. Uh, it worked remarkably well. We got a very first membrane protein structure at low resolution, at room temperature, no cooling of the specimens. And from that point on, I only worked on, occasionally I would do a little bit of X-ray diffraction mm -hmm. crystallography, but mainly I worked in electron microscopy and then eventually electron cryomicroscopy, where you're cooling the specimen. You have trained a number of scientists throughout the years. Do you have any advice for young people starting an academic career? I should say I haven't really ever tried to be training young scientists. Um, I always quite liked the idea of doing experiments myself, mm -hmm. whether it was at university or as, or as a PhD student. So I never uh, wanted to be a group leader, or, and I'm not a professor, you know, I'm a, just a research scientist. but. As uh, the years have gone by, and it's clear, you know, the, the, uh, from time to time, a younger scientist has said, could they come and work uh, alongside? And so n most of the colleagues I've had have been working either on their, s their own separate projects or alongside uh, me on, on the projects we were interested in. Mm -hmm. And my view has always been, is the main thing is to do what you like to do. And if you do it really well, somebody one day will pay you really well for doing what you really want and then you're doing a paid hobby. You should always aim for a high failure rate because if you aim for a high success rate you're not trying difficult enough experiments. Mm -hmm. So you should celebrate when your experiment fails because you've learned that that was a bad idea. Whereas if it works then you know you, 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 knew, that you knew it was going to work beforehand so you haven't mm -hmm. learned as much. You learn more from the experiments that fail than from the ones that do work. What have been your driving force throughout your amazing research? To me, it was always uh, to do with uh, the, the fascination of learning new things that you didn't know. Um, and of course, eventually, uh, you stop being taught established knowledge and then you become in, into research, as, as you two are both doing, where you are uh, trying to find out things nobody in the world has ever known before. And so, you know, uh, not so often but when you find out something new, you are the only person who knows that. Nobody, your supervisor doesn't know it, you know, the professors don't know it, only you know it. And so that is as exciting as learning how to write or how to count when you're four or five years old. Your Bachelor of Science was in physics and your research is applied on biological molecules and of course your Nobel Prize is in chemistry. Yeah. Do you think it's important for future research to focus more interdisciplinary uh, through different fields in science? Yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously, there is no real boundary, actually. It's just been labelled for the convenience of teaching or for having... You have to have departments with a certain size. They can't get too big. I had one interesting story. Where when I was at Yale, I had no chemistry background at all, but there was a very clever scientist, Ray Wong, who had come from Beijing in 1952. They gave him tenure. He was a professor, and I went there in 1970 uh, to work with him in a chemistry department. And while we were there... Uh, we learned he was leaving us. He'd been offered a job in Buffalo to be the Einstein professor. And they allowed him to be a professor of anything he wanted. And he would consult us. He said, what do you think I should be professor of? You know, I could be chemistry. And I, he had great difficulty because he was interdisciplinary. He was all over the place. And one day he came and he said, I've decided to be a professor of science. <laughs> <laughs> Forget all the disciplines. Yeah. And then after about another week, he thought, well, maybe this was a bit arrogant to be a professor of science. So he changed it and he became a professor of bioenergetics, which is a very, very narrow area. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time, Professor Henderson.
Uh, it's a great pleasure. It has been a real honor, and, and it's good been luck. very enlightening for the both of us to listen to. Good luck with both your projects. We're looking forward to your lecture.